So I just started recording. Now, when you're on here, you will, as a user, you'll have like a little uh, a tab over there that will allow you to, uh, let me just expand this to be full screen, if I can. Whoops, what have I done? Oh. Which one is it now? It's the... This one? It's... Yeah, Mozilla. I think, you're... I think that's it, right? Is that it? Yeah. No, that's not it. Uh, yeah, let's go down here. It's got to be this one. There we go. Okay. See the little tab over there? If you click that open, you can see that there's various things in here, including uh, you know, details about how to log on to this thing and so on and so forth. But there's a chat box down here. You can type in questions there, and you can direct those questions to the entire group so that we all see it, including me. Or you can actually direct them to me or someone else specifically. Did you so, want me to log in? Sure, if you wanted yeah, to. Good. You can maybe pass it around and show them yeah. what you see. And when you, if you want that out of your way, you don't want to really look at that, you can just click on that, and it'll push it over to the side. You can always do that. I have my own version of that over here. Uh, so actually, right now, I'm recording what's going on uh, as we speak. So what I wanted to show you, for starters, is I want to show you what these uh, workbooks look like. Okay, here's the uh, indoor air quality one. Let me start with the industrial ventilation, actually, which is back here. Okay. This is spiral bound typically. I'm not sure exactly how we're going to get the version that you're working with, but this is spiral bound. And the f first couple of chapters are really kind of an introduction into all of this material. Uh, uh, but you can see from the uh, table of contents, first, first chapter for, for tonight, the first two chapters are just basically an introduction and a characterization of what the issues are. In other words, contaminants and how they get into the air and what might be going on. Then as we get into chapters three and four next week, we're going to be talking about the behavior of air, the nature of air. We're going to cover a little of that tonight as a kind of an introduction, mostly as a thought process, you know, because we're really ahead of the game a little bit when we're talking about this. Uh, we, really have, we really have the material next week, real material next week. But uh, it'll kind of get us kind of like warmed up to this whole thing. And chapter four, dilution ventilation. We just mentioned that that uh, we just referred to two different kinds of ventilation. One, dilution ventilation, and the other one, exhaust ventilation. Dilution ventilation is the kind of ventilation that we have in the system that we're sitting in right now. The air that we're breathing is recirculated constantly throughout the building. It's cooled or heated as they need to, but it's constantly recirculated. So body odors, uh, 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 the uh, VOCs from the pens, so on and so forth, all get built up into that air. In order to control the level of those contaminants in the air, they actually take some of the recirculated air, exhaust it, and they pull in fresh outside air to replace it. So they're literally, as this is recirculating, they are exchanging maybe 5 or 10% of it or so with outside air. It'll vary at different times of the year. And that's dilution ventilation. What's the what's the good thing about that? Dilution ventilation, well, you know, we, it helps us control levels of the contaminants, but what's the downside? Downside is we're, we're getting exposed to all that stuff. Whereas body odor, it's just an annoyance, right? But where it is other kinds of contaminants, it could cause some health effects. So people are concerned about that now. So dilution ventilation takes the contaminants already in the air, and it keeps them within a manageable level. Exhaust ventilation or industrial ventilation, in that case, you're usually referring to laboratory hoods, industrial hoods. Anybody do any carpentry? So years ago, when, when, when you went into somebody's even home carpentry shop, if they had a big table saw and a couple of other, you know, a band saw or something like that, they'd be sitting there and they'd be sawing up, you know, some maple or something like that. And they'd be sawdust flying everywhere. Okay. Now, we know that hardwoods, hardwood sawdust, is a suspected na nasal and pharyngeal cancer causer, so carcinogen. So, so uh, we're concerned about that dust now. Not to mention the fact some people are sensitive to it, allergic to it, and so on. So nowadays, even amateur wood shops have cowling or shrouds that are over there that are around the cutting equipment that they use. That's connected to a vacuum system with a filter on it, or that exhausts outside. So they actually capture that stuff, that sawdust, as it's being cut before it gets into the air. So a lab hood does the same thing. If you were working with a, a solvent in a lab hood, uh, the, the velocity of the air across the face of the lab hood is such that 
the, the, it's unlikely that the fumes will escape, or at least that's your objective. So what happens is before the stuff gets into the air, you capture it and get it out of the space, the worker's space, uh, and so no one's exposed to it. It also has the advantage of dilution ventilation. We have an immense amount of air in this building. And even, even if we take 5 or 10% of the circulating air and dump it outside, we've lost all that warm air. We have to replace it with more cold air that has to be heated again. We, so it's an energy cost to it. But a lab hood, you can have that open two inches or something like that and have only a couple hundred CFM getting sucked out of the building and have even better containment of the contaminants than you would if you tried to just let it get loose into the building and then have to dilute it. So... Industrial ventilation is more protective and it's more uh, uh, more economical than dilution ventilation is. So we're going to be dealing with both of those kinds of systems because some industries, they do use dilution ventilation. There's reasons why they really can't control that very well. But that's what this book is all about. So that's what's in these first few chapters. Uh, just I'm just going to spin through this real quick because you, you don't have you know, we have you're a little bit at a disadvantage because you didn't get to see this the first couple of chapters before you came to class tonight. In the future, you'll have it kind of ahead of time. OK, and he discusses he discusses some some issues in industrial hygiene and so on and so forth. Uh, he asks simple questions about what do you think you have where you might apply it pretty much just like the kind of introduction that we've just done. He, does, he, he uh, discusses what kind of. Uh, 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 basically that industrial ventilation and, and has a control is basically a team effort. Uh, he discusses some different kinds of contaminants you might come across. He gives an example of, uh, in this case, carbon monoxide exposure and, and what the effect of it is. Uh, in this case, he's, uh, he's taking a little bit closer look at it. So this is one area he's looking at, one particular contaminant, one particular situation. In this case, you have a, a contaminant that the health effects the health effects can be cumulative. If you're, uh, you can be exposed to a certain level that by the next day you haven't recovered completely. So as you're exposed to it each day by day by day in the workplace, the effects are cumulative. So it's not, not just a matter of how much you're exposed to on a particular day. Uh, if you recover, and if you recover, then you, you're not, uh, the effect is not cumulative. At a certain level of carbon monoxide exposure, the effects become cumulative. Hi. Okay, so at any rate, so, so I'd ask a few uh, general questions. Then it goes into the uh, characterization of the problem. Stop, what, what is the stuff that's getting into the air? How is it getting into the air? How are you managing it? Uh, uh, what's the effect on the workers? Some workers are exposed because they're in the airstream. If the air is moving in a certain direction or if they're working right over some material, they're going to have a greater exposure than people that might be distant from it or upstream of where the airflow is. Okay, so it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. But this is and a, couple of, uh, a couple of case studies. Case studies are interesting because this is a guy that's been in the field. for do, do, He's actually retired at this stage. Um, uh, he was a, uh, a certified industrial hygienist and professional engineer. He was in the field for 40 or 50 years. So this is this guy that's got a lot of history in this field. So these case studies that he gives you are really interesting. Okay, so you're going to be looking at some of that. And then chapter three is going to be what we're going to be covering next week. So I won't, I won't preface this at this point. So we have a book here that's basically all um, uh, uh, industrial ventilation. And he has a similar workbook. And you'll see that there's peri periodically you'll see a problem, an example, a problem, and, and he'll give you answers and help you with how to work out that problem. These are echoed in the PowerPoints and in the uh, uh, spreadsheets. Each chapter has a PowerPoint that goes with it and a spreadsheet that goes with it. Uh, the indoor air quality one is very similar, except most indoor air quality is really dilution ventilation, where most industrial hygiene is capture ventilation or exhaust ventilation, most indoor air quality is, is associated with uh, 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 dilution ventilation because most of the sources are so distributed inside of the building. You know, we're not going to put a hood on everybody's pen, on everybody's magic walker or something like that. So it's, whatever's there is going to get into the air. Okay, and he discusses a lot of things that are specific to uh, uh, indoor air quality, uh, various standards that are available. There's, there's not very many standards where you know, that are applicable in indoor air quality, good good solid standards, but there are a few that people apply uh, to various situations. And there's other issues that, that uh, uh, come up as well. 
mold, radon. Uh, uh, anybody ever have, have to deal with radon in any kind of situation by home, have to have a radon test or anything like that? Right. Oh, really? How did that come up? Oh, they did a test, right? Radon is the second most common cause of lung cancer in the United States. Number one is smoking. Number two is radon, believe it or not. That's the thing is that it, it sometimes will be high and then more than it will be low and it's naturally yeah, it changed. Usually the winter it's higher because the winter you're out with your, fur your furnace and it's pulling air out of the house and this air escapes. So your house is under more of a negative pressure typically in the winter. So it's usually best to test it, depending on what kind of system you have, air, you know, heating system. Usually it's best to test in the winter because you close the house up or the windows are closed. Uh, uh, if you have a, a furnace or a boiler, you're, you're pulling air out of the house to, with combustion products out. So it keeps on negative pressure. Radon exists in the soil around the house. It gets pulled in uh, uh, more effectively when the house is closed up and under a negative pressure. But if you had it tested, usually any time of the year, if, if there's a serious level, usually pick it up uh, almost any time of year. There's an interesting story about it. Uh, there's a geological formation that, that runs through the Northeast from Pennsylvania, Northern New Jersey, and up into New England. Uh, that's called the Redding Prod. And that particular formation has an unusual amount of certain materials like radium that decay into radon gas that uh, and we're not talking like enough to mine. We're talking trace amounts, but more than you would find in other formations. And it has a lot of homes that are affected severely by radon within that area, but it's scattered around. A lot, and, you, know, you can find it almost any place, even a few places on Long Island that you're in again. You know, probability is most within that area though. So it's, it's become a problem in this region of the country. Um, uh, uh, there's an interesting anecdote, when we get to it, there's an interesting anecdote about how they first realized the magnitude of the issue uh, because, they, had, uh, because they, they realized that they kept finding a particular worker that kept being contaminated in a, uh, I think it was a, uh, 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 a, uh, a, uh, 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 I guess a uranium rod manufacturer, a recycling company. And he kept coming up and tripping off their alarms because he had been contaminated by some sort of alpha emitter. And it turned out to be his home that was contaminating him rather than the plant that he worked in. You know, so, but it, that kind of woke everybody up to the possibility that might be an issue. And then some studies confirmed how widespread that it was. But we'll talk about that as we go into the semester. Maybe there's even some stuff in here. Okay, so that's kind of stuff that you'll see in here. I'm not going to go any further through that stuff. And just to give you an idea what these uh, other materials look like, let's take a look at, I can't find it here. Here we go. Here's a, one of the PowerPoint presentations. Okay, let me see if I can't get the sound to play. It's similar to chapter three in the industrial ventilation book, except it also adds some information. What you're you going that? to do as he, as you've read plays, chapter three, that's okay. you're not going to be, I don't think you'd be able to. Oh, maybe this will be somewhat you can try to so yeah, What I'd like yeah. you to do is yeah, no. do chapter well, three there's, first. There's a technical issue that I won't tell you, but you can hear him kind of talking in the background. Review what happens is, as I step forward to each slide, his discussion on that slide. Now, what we're going to be talking and about pages and, four, and, and three to four, specific <coughs> material is covered in this slide metrics. is discussed within that slide. Maybe so you have not just what we do in this classroom, but, it talks about but you have this like other whole point. instructor, whole, other whole class on the same material. Yeah. As you read as well. through these pages. And you don't have to use it. It's not a requirement, but, you know, you can just keep up with what we do. But it's really nice to have, you know, I don't understand what Lee was saying. I get that a lot. Right. So, so you can you get you can get somebody else somebody else's version of it, and maybe it'll be more understandable. Especially the uh, Jeff Burton is kind of the guy where this stuff is concerned. And for each chapter, he also supplies a spreadsheet. And this spreadsheet, I'm going to try and blow it up a little bit so we can see the look. In this spreadsheet, the uh, the orange blocks are uh, are results of calculations. The green blocks are just labels, and the yellow blocks are places where you can put numbers in. You can input numbers. And if I change these numbers, it will do a certain calculation for me. Here's area and velocity. And you can use that to calculate the amount of air that's flowing. And how do you do that? 
Well, it's this cell times this cell, the area times the velocity, feet per minute times square feet is cubic feet per minute. Okay, so if I say that the area is two square feet and the velocity is uh, 500 feet per minute, well, it's at that two times 500 is 500 cubic feet per minute, right? Obviously, that's pretty simplistic. Uh, that's just one of the simpler ones. There are much more complicated calculations that he uses in here where you can just simply put the numbers in and he runs through the calculation. So if you know the formula that you want to apply, you don't have to build your own spreadsheet to do it or get your calculator out and 19 pieces of paper. He really speeds it up for you. You will have to understand where the formulas are applied and how to apply them. And we're going to talk about something in a second that's a real big issue in this course. And that's going to be how to deal with various different kinds of units that you're going to deal with. Okay. So, so you have this for every one of these chapters. Okay, don't want to save that. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, uh, let's see how we're doing on time. Let's talk about um, what we're going to be doing. Okay, and we'll get kind of into the subject matter. Actually, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna start that. I'm just gonna start that PowerPoint. I'm just gonna discuss. I, I need to make some notes here that we're gonna see. Um, air is basically a fluid. We deal with a lot of fluids. Water is a fluid, right? But there is a lot of similarities in how different fluids behave. We are in the business of measuring these fluids and predicting how these fluids are gonna work. We have water in one case, we have air in another case, and believe it or not, these systems ha are analogous to electrical systems as well. And I'm going to point out how, how that's the case in a second. Now, they're very complex systems. You know, we're going to look at it. We're going to use certain rules that simplify this whole thing. But they're very complex systems. For instance, despite the fact that there's all sorts of very elaborate engineering tools to use to evaluate uh, uh, airflow around design, like cars, airplanes, and uh, how a hull will perform, you know, in, uh, uh, in, a, uh, in, in a boat race or something like that. In the America's Cup, they design these very elaborate hull systems, uh, and so on and so forth. They still use things called wind tunnels and water tunnels, where they take a design for an airplane and they put it in a wind tunnel to check, it, even though they've used all sorts of uh, calculations to try and understand how it's going to react, how airflow is going to react to that system. Such complex systems that they still do experimental work with models to confirm what their calculations say. Anybody, any of you guys ever uh, hear about the incident they have with the City Corps building in New York City here? You know the City Corps building, right? It's uh, about a 50, 60 story building. It's the one with that slanted top. As you look in the middle, you can see one with a sloped top. And it's roughly, I don't know, 55 or 60 stories tall. Uh, they built it about 15 years ago. It's an unusual cantilever design. If you walk on the street next to it, uh, the, the, the building itself is about like three stories off the ground. And you can walk under the corners of the building. It has like a kind of T-shape, an X-shape structure, uh, corner to corner in that building. And, and uh, uh, there's spaces around, uh, or across the middle of the building. But you can actually walk under the building, you know, in the corners. Right. Uh, marvelously, marvelously engineered, perfectly designed, beautiful building. About five years or eight years after it was constructed, an engineering student, many engineering students, when they're at Pratt or one of these other places where they're taking architectural courses, they have projects just like we have a project. So you have a graduate architectural student has a project. And one of the things they might do is take a design and they might look at the and then analyze the, uh, the design. Um, this particular student analyzed the design. He said, gee, you know, there's a problem with this building. It doesn't look like it's going to withstand the wind, you know, the, the wind requirements that New York City uh, 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 building code requires. In other words, how much wind is hitting this building? Uh, and he wrote to the architect that design. He said, I don't understand this. When I do these calculations, I don't understand why I'm getting this calculation wrong. And in fact, his calculation Okay, however, it got the architect thinking about it because what he had done was he had made a mistake in terms of applying the building code. Building code required that you check uh, the effect on the building, the stresses on the building uh, from a certain number of different directions, like 90 degrees to each other or something like that. Uh, it, got him it, it, it kind of got him curious about it, and he ran some more calculations. 
And he determined that if it had it hit with a sustained wind of 90 miles an hour from a certain angle, that it would topple, knock the building over. Right. And uh, uh, he called the owner, he called the other engineers who were involved, the owner of the building, and they uh, contacted Office of Emergency Services. And they let them know that they thought they had a design flaw in this building. It might be a problem. And of course, when are we going to get 90 degree winds in New York when we get a hurricane? Right? That's probably the only time we're going to get that velocity winds. And we can get sustained 90, degree, 90 mile an hour winds in a hurricane easily. So uh, they got together and they put together a plan. They determined one of the reasons why the, it was under design was during the construction, they often make change orders during construction. One of the issues was they were going to use these, these uh, 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 joining members for the beams that were to be welded in. Uh, there was an issue with welding them in, so they, they uh, got a variance for using bolts on them instead. And they calculated the loads, and it seemed to be okay. Uh, turns out that that was part of uh, uh, what this issue was. So with the Office of Emergency Services, they secretly arranged for an evacuation plan with the Red Cross and with the uh, Office of Emergency Services to, if there was a hurricane approaching New York, to, eva to evacuate something like 20 square blocks of Manhattan around this building uh, as that hurricane was going to be approaching. So they, uh, starting in the spring, they had welders go into the building secretly. They didn't tell me about this after it was all done. They had welders go into this building secretly and uh, uh, weld reinforcing members into the corners of the building, you know, to, uh, to uh, make sure that it would be able to withstand the winds that it would need to have they got hit by a hurricane, and they completed it just before the next hurricane season. There's a lot of concern about whether they would have it done in time. But if I, I think PBS has actually have a DVD on this. You know, I have one of these shows on, on architectural issues and buildings and so on and so forth, construction. They actually have a DVD, a show, an hour-long show about this whole incident. You know, but I mean, that's, that's somebody was calculating velocities. In the air and the effect that it was going to have on the structure, forces and pressures and so on and so forth. Fortunately, no building is going to fall over in our course. Right? We don't have to worry about that. Any kind of mistake that we make is not going to involve a building falling over. So water, air, and electricity kind of have these certain kinds of things in common. It's okay. 9 o'clock. And it's 9 o'clock. Okay. Besides that, that's besides everything else. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the, the numbers are total. I mean, we could go over them, but the size of the toilet seat are your They cover a lot of the same material. I'm going to post this off, sir. Right. Yeah. It's all combined. It's all, 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 all be up there. Are you not planning to post them before we come to class? Oh yeah, I will. I will. I I will. This is kind of like a special situation. You know, yeah. this first time I'm doing this. You know, so I need a, I need a, I need a few alliances here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We we've just been working out this. We just worked out this uh, whole text thing this past week. What is that? Is that something I'm doing? No. Is that steam? Oh my God. Okay. All right. Good. I'm glad it's not me. Okay. So let's talk about right. So we have water. What? Uh, we have water. Water goes through pipes, right? Goes through pipes. Then it might go through a coil or a radiator or something like that. Then it comes back down. And uh, it might go to a heat source like a boiler or something like that. And then it goes to a pump. Pump then moves that water along. So this water flows through the circuit. Right? And what do we have in this circuit? We have something that causes the water to move, a, a pump. We have devices in here that cause a loss of velocity or friction. Right? So you have stuff in here that introduces a resistance to the flow of that water. And it affects the, and, and uh, you, you can continuously keep this stuff pumping around. It has a certain amount of resistance. We have to put energy into this system to make it work. The pressure here is higher than the pressure here, right? That's what keeps this whole thing moving. Okay? So that's a water system, right? So now here's an air system. We have pretty much the same thing, right? We have a fan. Instead of a pump, we have a fan, right? And that fan pushes air into a duct. That duct then supplies air to various devices. 
right? Might be into rooms and so on and so forth. And there might be filter filters in there. There might be other things, turning veins. There's actually resistance in the ductwork as well. And it comes back and we're it comes back to the fan and it gets pulled in, sucked into the fan, and again blown around. Again, the pressure on this side is higher than the pressure on this side, on the suction side of the fan. That's what makes this whole thing work. It's all this energy go through here. So um, uh, uh, we, we're interested in, well, how fast is this air moving? What's the resistance to it? How does that affect the whole thing? What are the pressures and so on and so forth? How can we use this to do various kinds of work and so on and so forth? And this whole thing is pretty much the same thing as kind of an electrical circuit. What happens with an electrical circuit? Whoop. There we go. Well, we got an electrical circuit. We got the same kind of thing, except that instead of a fan or a pump, what do we got? We got a battery, right? And that battery produces electrons, and those electrons go over to some device that you're running, right, which uses some of the power or has a resistance or something like that, and then comes back to the battery again. And so we have, say, we have a device that's providing energy for the electrons to move. Uh, we have resistance. That can be variable, and then we have this whole thing return back to this device. In this case, charge might be positive, charge might be negative. Benjamin Franklin screwed this whole thing up, so we have everything reversed. You know, in, in, uh, as you know what it really, the charges really are. We can talk about that another time. So a lot of these systems, fluid systems, these electrical systems, and so on and so forth, the myth behind them, the the theory behind them, has a lot of similarities. Okay, so we're gonna let's move on to. We want to talk about here. Okay, so our favorite fluid for this course is going to be air. Okay, let's talk about what air is. Air is 97% nitrogen. What else? What are the other components of air? What's the next biggest one? Yeah, what's oxygen? You, you people should know, right? 21%, right? Roughly 21%, right? So what's that? That's 99%. Right. So the rest of it, basically, for most of what we're going to be doing, the rest of it is basically we don't give a rat's behind what the rest of it is most of the time. Right. Because this is what air is. Air is nitrogen and oxygen. There are trace elements also that will affect us. Right. That will be important to us. But primarily when we're doing calculations of flow and stuff like that, we're really interested in the main components of air, nitrogen and oxygen. Okay, and, and that gives us what the density of air is, what the molecular weight of air is. That's all derived from really what these primary gases are. But I can think of at least three other things that are in air that are going to be pretty important to us in terms of environmental, building environmental systems, in terms of indoor air quality, in terms of the general environment and stuff like that. Anybody think of what they might be? Particulates? Yeah, particulates, yeah, but, you know, that's... Argon. Argon. Argon, yeah, that's an inert gas, though, so it's not, it doesn't affect anything, right? Won't it'll never react with anything. So argon, yeah, well, argon's the next, next one of the next biggest components. How about, uh, how about water vapor, moisture, right? Humidity is going to be important in these systems, right? Especially environment, uh, indoor environmental systems. Maybe not so much in our exhaust systems, but there are going to be times when we're going to be. It's going to be an issue as well. We've got to worry about condensation and when we have a temperature change or something like this. So uh, moisture. And Paper. What else? What, what, do we, what do we hear about every week in the newspaper? Carbon dioxide, right? Greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and so on and so forth. They don't make up a very big percentage of the air, but they're important to us because of these environmental issues, the, the fact that they're greenhouse gases. So carbon dioxide and methane and so on. Uh, what else? Well, let me think. Of, there's something else. I'll think of a couple of other ones that, that might be an issue for us as well. But those are primarily what we're concerned about. But as far as we're concerned, air is, as far as we're concerned, when we do calculation, air is, is basically nitrogen and some oxygen. Anybody have friends that, that fill their, their car tires with nitrogen? Have you guys ever heard of this? Yeah. Among car enthusiasts, yes. it's very popular to fill your car tires with pure nitrogen uh, uh, rather than air. Now, no amount of, you know, my telling my friends that, Basically, air is nitrogen. Air has impacted them whatsoever. They're convinced that their cars will go faster, run better, and you know just perform 100% better if they have nitrogen in their cars. 
than, than, than uh, rather than air. But you know, that's yeah. I based on the fact that air is eighty percent nitrogen and oxygen. Really, you know, is not really different in terms of like the properties of ni- uh, uh, properties in terms of molecular weight and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, it's irrational, but it's good to deal with irrational people every once in a while. One of the problems we have with air that we don't have with water is water is an incompressible fluid. You can press water together as much as you want. You'll get virtually no volume change. It does change with temperature. It does expand and contract. What happens when you lower the temperature of water? Does it expand or contract? Cool. It contracts. Like almost anything contracts, except that it's got a little bit of a glitch. It contracts until it gets to about 4 degrees centigrade. What does it do when it gets to 4 degrees centigrade and goes down below that? It expands. That's why your ice cube floats in your lake. That's why the water freezes on the surface of your lake rather than drop down to the bottom of the lake and continue to, to uh, uh, freeze. Because in the change from 4 degrees centigrade water to ice, it's actually expanding. It takes, so it's less dense. Its density is less than water at 4 degrees. So what does that mean? That means we have lakes that, are, that you know, have a skim of uh, ice on top of them. Uh, which insulates them so the water doesn't freeze all the way through. And a lot of people would, would argue that that property water means that in these northern latitudes where we have, in temperate latitudes where we have freezing winters, that that's the only reason we have life in, in a lot of these water bodies, these in, interior water bodies, is the fact that water has that property and lakes don't freeze all the way through. Um, so that's an important property. If you have a building system like in here, there's water running through the pipes, that's probably air vent. I don't think they use steam here, that's probably water it might have been venting some air just now right what, what about that if they the leak goes off in here and the water in there freezes what happens to those pipes bang yeah it is so incompressible that as it expands it generates immense amounts of pressure to, and it, it literally bur- will burst that pipe a lot of those systems like this may have antifreeze in them instead of water we'll find out about that when get the building Right. In fact, they might just be heap. I don't know what the, what's in there yet. We'll find out what's in there. OK, so the big difference between air and a lot of other fluids, air is compressible. The more you can, the more you compress it, the less volume it takes. So there's something called the ideal gas laws. They describe the relationship between temperature, pressure and volume. So if you take air and you squeeze it and you compress it, what's going to happen to pressure? goes up. What's going to happen to the temperature? goes up as well, right? If you let it expand, right, they go down. So there's a relationship. Pressure and volume are on the top of that. Temperature is on the bottom. As, as the volume goes up, right, well, uh, as the pressure, as these various numbers change, you know, uh, we can take advantage of that relationship to calculate what the changes are. We're going to do that. The very last thing we do tonight, we're going to do that. Okay, uh, density of air changes also. Yeah, if you if you cool the air, and it's a smaller volume, now it's a more dense material, right? It's heavier, denser, right? Well, that means that gee, maybe it takes more energy to move it, because you're moving more mass, more work. Their fan has to work harder to move that. To, uh, a fan that runs uh, that uh, uh, is going to move 100 cubic feet per minute of air through a duct. It's going to use a certain amount of energy if the temperature is high and the, de- and, and the density of the air is low. It takes less energy than if the temperature of the air, air is uh, lower and it's a denser material. Right? So it's got more mass to it, to that 100 cubic feet. So, so it takes more energy to do it. Now, for the most part, especially in the beginning of this course, we're not going to pay too much attention to that because most of the time that's really not a significant effect. In other words, you're not going to go into the draft that Siskin and Hennessy engineers and their mechanical, their mechanical engineers are going to be sitting there calculating the density of air, you know, because, because uh, uh, they're designing from Morningside Heights instead of like, you know, the Battery Park City and an extra 200 feet or something like that. They ain't worried about that. They're worried about the big, bigger picture, right? So we're going we're gonna to be looking at that because as scientists as well as ventilation engineers, we're interested in these properties of air not going to be our primary interest in terms of designing ventilation systems. There's going to be other bigger factors that are going to affect how much air we move. Um, 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 okay. 
The other complication with dealing with air besides uh, compressible fluid and changes in density and stuff like that is nothing is ever in the same units. Everything is either PSI, that's an English unit, or millimeters, or metric, or this, or that, energy and pascals, and so on and so forth. And it's just a, a real headache, right? But we have to deal with that headache. How many of you guys know what the term dimensional analysis means? You ever heard of that before? You don't use it much anymore. It's gone out of vogue. Uh, dimensional analysis. You know when you 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 uh, we we just looked at a formula, for instance, uh, the Q volume of air that you're moving is equal to the velocity times the cross-sectional area of the duct. So if you have a one square foot duct, right, you're moving air at uh, 100 feet per minute through that one square foot. Q is equal to the velocity. Now they're both the same, both the same uh, uh, system, dimensional system, right? U.S. or or uh, uh, English system, right? It's feet and it's square feet. So you're moving 100 uh, feet per minute through the ductwork and through one square foot. So 100 feet per minute times one square foot is 100. But if you look at the dimension, feet per minute times square feet, right? Feet squared is, well, the feet squared times feet is going to be feet cubed. And you're still going to have at the bottom of that, you're still going to have minutes. So you're moving 100 cubic feet per minute through that ductwork, right? So your volume is cubic feet per minute. If I ignored the numbers, and instead of looking at the numbers, let me see if I can't get my notepad up here. If I ignored the numbers, I'll just do it up here. This is kind of important to us because this is going to just kill us all semester long if we really, if we really let it get away from us. Okay, here's a duct. Happens to be a rectangular duct. Oops. Right, this is one foot by one foot, so it's one square foot. The air that's moving through here, the velocity is equal to 100 feet per minute. Right, the area is equal to one foot times one foot or one foot squared. Right, one foot squared. And Q is equal to V times A. Right, Q is equal to 100 feet per minute times uh, one foot squared, one square foot or one foot squared. So if I, I know the answer in numbers is going to be 100. If I look at just the units, I, see, I go over here and I say Q is equal to, I'm not going to look at the numbers, feet per minute times feet squared. Well, what's that equal to? That's feet cubed per minute, cubic feet per minute. This is dimensional analysis. You can pull the numbers out of there. You should be able to pull the numbers out of there. Very simple calculation. When we have a much more complicated calculation, you can use this as a tool to figure out if you've made a mistake. Because if at the end you don't get the right units that it's supposed to be in, you know something happened. Maybe I didn't convert something. Maybe one thing was in millimeter, millimeters and I forgot to convert it. Uh, there was actually was a, loon, there was a Martian Explorer satellite that crashed. I think a few years ago, it was supposed to circle Mars and, uh, and map the surface of Mars for future missions. And it was a joint, uh, I don't know, European and American project. And it crashed. And they determined, like, about a year after that, the reason why it crashed, they made a mistake in the design of it in conversion of, of uh, units from, uh, from English units to metric units in the design of the device. Right. You can look this up. As Casey Stengel was a, a, a pretty famous baseball guy. You guys are younger. You may not know him as well as I do. But he used to have an expression. You can look it up. Right. So you can actually Google this stuff and you can find out whether I'm lying or not. In fact, I encourage you to, to check on me and see if I'm lying to you or not about the city core building, about, about that uh, land. You would think this stuff would never happen, right? How could something like that happen? I think it was like, I don't know, $500 million satellite. Too. It was a really, a really expensive mistake. If they had done dimensional analysis, they might have caught that mistake, right? Okay. Yeah, so nothing. Another useful one for your. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a lot of a lot of problems on there that involve like you know like little tricks with uh, you know trying to trick you with you know like you know like confusing units and stuff like that. You know, hoping that like you you'll pick the wrong. In other words, they'll give you four answers, and one of the answers will be a couple of answers. 
work if you didn't do the conversions. You know, so it's kind of tricky. Okay, and so here, we're just looking at units for temperature, barometric pressure, so on and so, density, uh, and in different kinds of systems. Okay, so as air to moving simple duct, we just talked about that. Q is equal to velocity times the area. You can do that with a, you can do that with a, uh, a round duct, a square duct. With a round duct, you just have to figure the area with, with what? Pi r squared. Just use the difference of formula for the area. Okay, so now... This is, the, this is the simple view of air moving through that duct, right? Oh, the air's moving down, down 100 feet per minute. Enough, right? No confusion. Push 100 feet per minute uh, uh, over here. Uh, if, I, if I stick my finger in here, uh, a minute later, that A is going to be 100 feet away down the ductwork, right? Well, unfortunately, that's the simple view. Is kind of what we're looking at is on the right-hand side there. This is that it's all moving through the ductwork unit. Well, it is on the average. But really what's happening is more what's on the left side there. There's frictional effects and turbulence on the outer edge of that ductwork. The air on the outer edge of that ductwork is actually moving slower than the air in the middle of that ductwork. That complicates things for us. How do we measure that? We can stick a device in there into that duct to measure how fast the air is moving. But where inside there do we stick that device to measure it when it's different flow rates through the whole thing? Right, and you want to know something? The guys that took industrial uh, the uh, laboratory, right? They did that. They learned how to how to average that, uh, uh, use techniques to average that, take enough readings and type of readings that will help you average that and get an average reading for the flow rate through that ductwork, so that you can use it effectively to really understand, you know, what what's going on inside the, the ductwork. So the reality is a little bit different. The shapes that you have uh, in air conditioning ductwork, it's a rectangular duct. Smaller ductwork that maybe goes to some of these diffusers, these are called diffusers up here, and they're just there so that the cold air, just a cold or hot air, just goes straight down on your head, you know. And one guy gets like, you know, like chilled, the other guy gets, you know, baked or something like that. So they're just there to allow, allow it to mix. You know, next time you're in a building that the air conditioning is on the lower floor, I want you to look at those diffusers, especially like a bank, where uh, banks have security issues, so. So they have their own air conditioning system usually other than the building air conditioning system. And because they're on the first floor all the time, they'll be pulling fresh air from the street. They're always on active corners, right? And maybe a bus stop right outside of the bank, a lot of soot, a lot of dirt and particular matter and soot. If you look at the diffusers in many banks and you look at them, you'll notice that there's ghosting or staining around the diffusers. And what's happening there is, is that there's a lot of soot and particular matter, oily, sooty matter in they're coming in as particulates, you know, from the fresh air intakes. And those are taking that air, instead of dropping it straight down, they take it and the air bends around, goes back up and hits the ceiling. And the particles, right, they have a little bit of mass, they actually stick to the ceiling rather than, you know, continue to bounce off of it and come down into the room. And you'll see different patterns around different diffusers based on, like, you know, what the particular design of that particular diffuser is. It's kind of interesting. If you're really, like, if you're really a, a ventilation geek, You'll start to notice stuff like that. Uh, and in fact, a lot of times in the future, when, when you're an industrial uh, an indoor air quality expert and an industrial hygiene uh, 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 person, you might get a call and say, gee, I, I got a problem. I think I got mold you know, coming from my diffusers. And you go in, you'll see that dusting, and you'll recognize it's ghosting from that soot rather than necessarily as mold. Right? So a lot of people look at that, and they see that black stuff, and they think, gee, that must and one thing, you know, in the, you're in the building, you've got one of the different the slides, and the other one is up here. But yeah. you have to look, if we do the tour, he will let you know, you have to look from the side to see which one. We're going to, when we go down to the lab, at one of these sessions, we're actually going to measure the air going in and coming out. So you'll actually see which ones. And this is unusual because most of them, most of the times you walk into a room and you'll get one of those like that and another one that just looks like a little... A little kind of mesh grill, you know, and it's obvious which ones. Is, what, what they did here was they disguised what was an intake and what was an exhaust. They used the same because they thought it would look better, you know. But that's actually one of these two is just a hole in the ceiling, right? Because the ceiling space is a place where the air returns to the unit and again. That's called a return air planet. Again, that's something we're going to get into later on. Okay, so one of the things that we have we know is related is we know that if we 
we use a fan to move air, like as we do in the right hand side here. Right? We use we use a, a fan to impart energy to air and push it through the ductwork and distribute it, and then the the uh, uh, and then return it back to that fan so you can do the whole thing all over again. Well, we know looking at pump works, the way fan works, and so on and so forth. The real thing that causes the motion is a difference in pressure upstream and downstream of the fan. So if we look at this upstream of the fan, we have different ways of measuring pressure. One of the one of the ways we measure pressure is we measure something called static pressure. The other thing that we measure is called velocity pressure. Let's think about static pressure. If you blow a balloon up, that air that's inside of that balloon is under pressure, but it's not moving anywhere. That's called static pressure. You can feel that on a duct. If you drill a hole into the duct and air is leaking out, you can air, air blowing out of it. That's the static pressure in the duct. That's the, the pressure that's all throughout the duct pushing out on all sides. And sometimes you turn a fan on, you'll actually see the, you'll ever see the duct where it kind of buckle out a little bit, you know, because there's pressure pushing against the sides. That pressure is called static pressure. You also have another kind of pressure. And that's the pressure that's associated with the movement of the air through the ductwork. In other words, when you put your hand in front of your vacuum cleaner and the exhaust of your vacuum cleaner, the air's blowing out and hitting your, your, your hand, that is called velocity pressure. So inside of a ductwork, you have static pressure, which is acting in all directions, against the ductwork, against the top, against the bottom, just like inside of a balloon. It's even, uh, it's even pushing the direction of the velocity and against the direction of velocity. It's working in all different directions at the same time. Static pressure. The velocity pressure is only the pressure that, you, that is causing the movement of the air in the ductwork. So in a duct, we have a situation where when we're downstream, when we're, when we're uh, excuse me, downstream in a fan, uh, see upstream is the air, the fans, it's moving left to, left to right here. When we are downstream of the fan, what do we have? We have velocity pressure because you can feel the air moving against that, that, that ductwork, right? We have static pressure. The static pressure, what is that? Is that positive or negative? Is it pushing out against the duct or sucking in on the ductwork? Downstream, pushing out, right? The fan is pushing the air. So downstream of the fan, it's pushing the ductwork out. So the static pressure is positive and the velocity pressure is positive. We add those two pressures together and call that total pressure. Okay, we're, go we're gonna get into the numbers. We're just thinking about whether it's positive or negative on either side of the fan. Before the fan, upstream of the fan, the air is moving towards the fan. So it's got velocity. So the velocity pressure is positive or negative? It's positive because it, the air is moving, right? If we put our hand in there, we feel the, uh, the air hitting our hand. How about the static pressure? If we put a hole in there, would it suck air in or would it blow air out on the suction side of the fan? Suck air in. The static pressure upstream of the fan is negative, right? And the uh, uh, but the uh, uh, the, the, the I'm I ignore total pressure there for a moment, right? Because uh, we really don't know what that's going to be until we we deal with the static pressure, the velocity pressure. Uh, static pressure is negative, and then the velocity pressure is, is positive on both sides when that fan is running. But the static pressure is negative before the fan and positive after the fan. In other words, put a hole in it, pushes air out after the fan. Put a hole in it before the fan, and it's sucking air in. Okay, so we're going to be dealing with that those pressures, and they're important to us because that's what imparts movement to the air. The higher the velocity pressure is, the more the, the faster the air is. The lower the velocity pressure is, the slower the air is moving. Okay, so we we use tools to measure this stuff. We use things called manometers. Manometer is basically just a tube with water in it. Okay, now if I just have that, if I'm just holding a plastic tube that you can see through, and I hold both ends up, and it's not completely full of water. Well, the water is going to equilibrate. It's going to be the same level in both tubes. If I drill a hole into the ductwork and I, I take that end of that tube, one end of that tube, and I hold it up against that hole in the ductwork, right? So it's, I was only measuring the pressure right at the edge of the 
done, right? Well, if it's on the downstream side of the fan where the static pressure is positive, it's going to take the water, push it down, and put, push the other side up. So it's going to be a difference in the level of the water. In, in most American systems, we use how much it moves that water as a measurement of the static pressure, right? We actually literally call it, we call it static pressure is two inches of water. In other words, that's how much it is. That pressure is the same thing as the weight of two inches of water, the difference between those two columns. If I move that over to the other side, now it sucks on that side, so now the other side's gonna move down, this side's gonna be, gonna be moving up, and very frequently be roughly the same static pressure except the negative static pressure if the duct works the same size. So we can use that simple tube to tell us what the static pressure is. So now if you look at that gauge on the bottom, that's basically the same kind of device except it uses a spring on it to judge what the pressures are. Right? But you'll see that device on ductwork all over the place because the engineers, in this, including in this building, because they want to know what the static pressure is, what the velocity pressure is, so they can see what's going on in the system. Okay. If you have a resistance to flow, so that the fan is forcing air, it's having a harder time moving air, for instance, across a filter. As the filter gets dirty, you get a resistance to airflow. So the static gets higher before the filter and lower after the filter. So there's a bigger difference in static pressure across the filter as it gets dirty. Filters clean, there's almost no difference, right? Because there's almost no resistance to airflow. So we're going to take advantage of that. The other device here is called a pitot tube. Pitot tube is very similar to a, to a, uh, a manometer, except that we take it, we bend the end of it so that we can, we can actually connect it to the, one of those two tubes. And we can point it in the direction of airflow so we can measure the velocity pressure as it's hitting the front of that tube. Now, remember what I told you. That if we're measuring, here it is, this is coming out, it's connected to that tube, the air is hitting it and it's pushing the tube, it's displacing the water in that tube. Is it measuring the velocity pressure now? Is that you guys agree with me that's measuring the velocity pressure, the pressure caused by the velocity of the air? Everybody agree with that? You're all wrong. Because what, what else is it measuring besides velocity pressure? What other pressure is in there that acts or acts constantly in all directions? Static pressure, total pressure, it's measuring the total pressure. So we have to take that pressure, subtract the static pressure from it to get what the velocity pressure is. Right? See, a little bit of a trick, right? So the pitot tube does that for us. Any plan we know any place else where they use pitot tubes that you might have read in the news in the last like month that's now sitting at the bottom of the Indian Ocean or something like that? Right? The airplane that just crashed, right? That airline. Yes. They suspect that they, they misinterpreted the airspeed in that airplane. What do they use to measure the, the speed at which the, the, air, the, uh, the uh, speed at which that plane is moving through the air? They use a pitot tube. That pitot tube tells them, it measure, they actually have pitot tube, has two sections on them. One measures static pressure, the other one measures the total pressure, and, and, you, and you subtract the difference, and it gives you the velocity pressure. Velocity pressure tells the, uh, the guys running the airplane how fast it's moving through the air. And why do they need to know that? Because under a certain speed, they can't stay in the air. They'll stall and fall out of the air. They, uh, it's not aerodynamically stable. It'll come out of the air. They lose lift, right? Those pitot tubes have been associated with two crashes now. That French airplane that, was, uh, that uh, uh, was crossing the Atlantic that crashed about five years ago, and now they suspect this new one may have it, had an issue. Perhaps with pitot tubes, perhaps with something. It's something to do with the, the misinterpreting the velocity, the, the, the speed at which the plane was moving. And that's what that's basically how they moved these things. The French airliner, it had become iced up. And they knew they had, a, they knew, they suspected from other issues that hadn't caused, that other incidents hadn't caused a crash that they might have had with the heaters in these things to keep them from icing up. Uh, but they had never fixed the, that issue, right? So these P2 tubes, that, they use them to measure velocity pressure. Velocity pressure tells you what the speed is. Okay. And in fact, what you can do is you can combine the instrument. 
so that you have one section of it pointing into the upward in the direction uh, into the flow and you have the other section pointing the other thing so you measure static and velocity pressure at the same time don't worry about that when we get into the lab and we get into the section that's going to make sense to you now we got all sorts of tools for doing all this stuff right among the tools that we have uh, are software right there's software programs that you can buy that that uh, designers use to actually design ductwork that you know that you can put in the size of the ductwork kind of system you're using how many how many uh, uh, turns it has what kind of turns what kind of transitions we're going to be looking at all these different kinds of duct systems uh, devices dampers turning veins, uh, 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 transitions from bigger duct to smaller duct. We're going to be looking at all this stuff. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be really interesting. We're going to be able to see some systems like this in real life that we can kind of look at and kind of really figure out what's going on there, where you would look at it now and be a little bit confusing. You'll actually understand how that works. Um, there are also spreadsheet programs, like the one that we have with come with, uh, spreadsheets that come with each one of the chapters that we're going to be working on. There's something called nomographs. Anybody know what a nomograph is? Nomographs used to be very big before people had electronic calculators. They are graphical devices that allow you to use a straight line or a ruler or something like that to, to make calculations between two scales that are drawn, two number scales that are drawn that have some relationship. So, for instance, here's a simple one right here. That's a nomograph that translates Fahrenheit into Celsius. Right. If I if I were to look up here, like, let's see. Oh, I don't have my I can't uh, do this that way. Hang on a second. Uh, yeah. You know, I should figure out some sort of way to get a pointer on there. Right. So, for instance, if I read this, I'm pretty close to the middle there. 60 degrees Fahrenheit is roughly. What does it look like to you? About 17 degrees Celsius. Right. Top scale and bottom scale coordinate so you can just read Fahrenheit on one. Um, let's see, 120 degrees Fahrenheit is roughly 48 degrees Celsius. Right? You can use a nomograph to do that. Here's another nomograph. Okay, this one from the textbook. And the way this one works is, well, let's say, let's see, if I have the velocity, uh, let's say the velocity is 200 feet per minute, and the area of the ductwork, the cross-sectional area of the ductwork, ductwork is eight square feet. If I lay a ruler across from 200, see that 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 uh, the second column from the right is velocity. If I lay a, lay a straight uh, a ruler from 200, and I put the other edge on the eight, uh, where it crosses that center line Q is the velocity in feet per minute. And you can use this same chart to figure out, well, I don't know what the, it's round ductwork, and I, I know the diameter, I don't know the exact square footage. You can say, oh, velocity 200 and diameter 20 inches, and you can just connect those two and get Q. And also to get figure out what the area is, cross-sectional areas. You can uh, uh, and use it very ways, you know, in other manners as well. So these nomographs are tools. Right? And these nomographs basically are number sets. I, I'll show you another one here. There are engineers that use devices called slide rules. And I got one here. Okay, a slide rule is just a mechanical version of these uh, nomographs. Okay. When I, another one, I, uh, when I was a kid, I walked 50 miles in the snow to get to school. Yeah. Right. When I was in uh, school, we didn't have we, we we didn't have electronic calculators. They were just starting to appear. They were certainly out of the range of any students that any students that would be able to afford them. Right. We used to use slide rules. One of my jobs as a uh, in teaching, uh, one form or another. Uh, I I I worked since I was 12 years old. I worked at pizzeria. A friend of mine's father's pizzeria. 12 years old, I just constantly had every kind of job you can imagine, ice cream, bungalow barman, uh, you know, uh, uh, you name it. So, so uh, 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 one of my first teaching jobs was New York City Community Colleges started an open enrollment program in roughly, I guess, 68, 69 or something like that. And uh, New York City Community College, which was across the street from the school that I went to, um, um, uh, started to need people, anybody that had a high school diploma in New York City could go to college. Now, 
if they hadn't taken enough math or science or something like that, they had to take remedial courses. You could take regular college coursework. And it was free. Didn't pay a dime. Paid like a $20 registration fee or something like that. You didn't pay a dime in tuition beyond that. Right? It was back in the Rockefeller years. Very good educational policy, very bad drug policy. But that's a whole other <laughs> story. So, so, so you could, there's a lot of people showing up to go to college that were taking remedial courses in math and other subjects that they hadn't taken in high school in order to be able to take college level courses. So they were hiring people left and right. And we happened to be a college, an engineering college across the street from them on J Street, Brooklyn Poly, and this, and they, and New York City Community College right across the street on J Street. And they hired a bunch of people, you know, to go up there and act as math tutors. And basically what they had done is they set up these labs. Like, you ever see a language lab where you have like a, you kind of have like a, cu a cubicle, a little cubby hole where it's like side, you know, they have these boards on the side and you kind of like can scoot in there in a chair. So you got your little private area over here, kind of like a little soundproof. And they would have rooms with a hundred of these little things, these things. In them. And people would go in there and work on homework. They would pay us $6 an hour, which was an astronomical amount of money. I mean, I was working... Most jobs I had were like a little above minimum wage. It was like $1.35 an hour back in those days. They were paying us $6 an hour. We thought they were incredible suckers. It was the greatest thing that ever happened. It really got me through my last year of school because, you know, I, I really didn't have the time at that point to like really work a lot of hours. Back in those days, you could work and pay a lot of your own tuition because tuition was 1600 bucks. It wasn't sixteen, you know, 60000 So at any rate, this is basically an omograph. You slide these scales back and forth to multiply, divide square roots, trigonometric functions, you name it. One of these days, when we got a few minutes, I'll give you a demonstration of it on, on the board. So I must have taught 300 people how to use slides. Within a year or two years, they were obsolete because Texas Instrument came out with a TI-19, TI-10 or something like that for under $100, and everybody was throwing their slide roots away and going over to use calculators. A couple of years before that, the only electronic calculator I ever seen was a made by Wang, and it had something called Nixie tubes. Those are those funny big tubes that are about that big. And they got wires on the side of them, and the wires would actually glow and change numbers and so on and so forth. And they wouldn't allow us to touch it. We could only look at it, you know, because it was so expensive. We were only allowed to look at it through one of those windows with the wires in it, you know, so we could see other people, the professors playing with it, and we weren't allowed to touch it. So at any rate, so things changed very quickly. But that slide rule is very similar to these nomographs. In fact, they have slide rules. They're usually round called ductilators that ductwork designers actually use to calculate airflows and resistances and fan speeds and so on and so forth. And to this day, a lot of them still, a lot of the old timers still like to use those because it's very fast and simple calculation. Just twist this thing and make certain numbers appear in you know, this window and you get an answer in this other window. And basically it's just another version of a slide or a nomograph. And people actually use this stuff to this day. Now we have spreadsheets. How many of you guys would say that you are like really pretty good, pretty expert with Excel. How many of you guys say that you're middle range with Excel? Pretty good. How many of you guys are novices with Excel? Okay, so we're gonna help you guys. We're gonna get you. Yeah, we're, we're gonna get, we're gonna get, for those of you guys who have a little less experience than the other guys, we're gonna be using Excel quite a bit because Excel is a program that allows us to do a lot of calculations very efficiently and very effectively. And it has a lot of functionality built into it for a lot of specific kind of uh, 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 science disciplines. Uh, there is statistical functions built into it. There are engineering functions built into it. There are financial functions built into it. So you name it, it's got it. You know, so so it's really useful even beyond this course for other applications. You've got, uh, you'll uh, many of you it, once you get really good with it or comfortable with it, you'll use it in preference to a calculator because. A lot of reasons you might do that because you can replicate everything you've done. You can check it. You can make changes. But we'll talk about that later. How are we doing on time? Okay, we're getting pretty close to the end. And again, each each one of these chapters comes with a spreadsheet that looks something like that. Okay, let's talk about a, um, a potential exposure. Uh, I'm gonna. This is just kind of a little exercise that involves some of the things that we've been talking about: volumes and and uh, you and so on and so forth. I'm going to release one pound of acetone into this room right here, right? It's going to, it's going to take up an hour for it to evaporate into the air. Perfect mix, right? You can mix, mix perfectly in this room. There's no air changes in here. The air conditioning system's not working. 
what's the concentration going to be? That what's the final concentration of acetone going to be in this room? Okay, we're going to take a material, one pound of a material, and we're going to change that into a, into a gas, right? Okay, so what determines what the concentration is? Well, for starters, we need to know uh, what, what are the units for volume uh, for a concentration of, uh, uh, of something in the air? What do we usually use? PPM, okay. Right? Sometimes we use grams per cubic meter, but a lot of times we use PPM, parts per million. Parts per million when you're working with liquids is weight to volume. Milligrams per liter, same thing as parts per million. Not like that with air, right? Parts per million with air are volume to volume. What's the volume of one pound of acetone compared to the volume of this entire room? Okay, how do I calculate what the volume of one pound of acetone is? Anybody want to hazard a guess? I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you uh, you don't you don't know the density of acetone. So I'm gonna say that that uh, 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 that one pound of acetone is the same same thing as I'm gonna make a number of 580 grams of acetone. Okay, what did I just do there? I changed the unit, didn't I? Right? I changed it from pounds to grams. I needed to change it from pounds to grams. Why did I need to change it from pounds to grams? I need to calculate volume. What's the volume that one mole of acid? 22.4. Remember, you guys remember that? Avogadro's number, one mole of anything, right, uh, of gas, one mole of any gas takes up at standard temperature and pressure, we're going to argue for a moment that this is standard temperature and pressure, takes up 22.4 liters, mole, right? Um, 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 okay, so one mole. How many, what, what does a mole stand for? Mole is the molecular weight in grams. What's the molecular weight of acetone? Anyone has it a guess? I'll give you a hint. I just said 580 grams to make this easy, right? So carbon, what's acetone? Three carbons and so on and so forth, right? The molecular weight of, if you add up all the carbons and hydrogens and so on and so forth, the molecular weight of uh, acetone is 58. How many moles of acetone do we have? We have 10, right? 10 moles, 580 grams, 48, 58 grams per mole. We have 10 moles. So what's the volume of acetone that we have? It's equal to what? 10 times 22.4. Okay. You know it's late. I can tell that you guys are tired. Because this, I know you know this stuff. Right? This is simple enough that I know you know this stuff. And if you if you're having struggling with a little bit, you're tired. Uh, hopefully, if this records well, you can always go back and, and take a look at it again as we're talking about it. Right? How did I start here? I said I'm releasing 580 grams of acetone. I ought, that was a pound. That's that, it's not really a pound. It's more than a pound. Right? A couple of pounds. Right? Of acetone into the air. And uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I want to know what percentage of, uh, if it mixes perfectly in this room and no air changes, what percentage of the air is now, what's the, what's the uh, uh, PPM of acetone in this space right now? Okay, so first thing I had to do was change that pound, or a couple of pounds, two pounds, into grams. It's five, uh, we argued 580. I just made that up, so it's an easy number to work with. The molecular weight of acetone is 58, so I have 10 moles of acetone. 10 moles of any gas, a mole of any gas takes up 2.4 liters at standard temperature and pressure, room temperature, basically. Okay, so that's, so that we have, basically, we have uh, 10 moles, and each mole, that's, what do we say, it was um, uh, 22.4 liters per mole. Well, so we have 224 liters. How many liters of air do we have in this room? What are the dimensions of this room? I'd say roughly 10 feet by uh, 50 feet, right? You guys agree? By 50 feet. So 50 times 50 is 2,500 times 10 
is 25,000 cubic feet. I'm going to put this over here, 25,000 cubic feet. Doing it again. That's some, that sounds probably some sort of pneumatic control. It's changing position. It's getting too hot in here. It's turning the heat off. Okay. So 50 times 50 is 2,500 times uh, the height 10 is 2,500 cubic feet. I don't need it in cubic feet. I need to know it in liters. So what's the conversion factor for cubic feet to liters? Anybody know? Anyone who has it a guess? What is it? Oh, yeah. I think you have it on there somewhere. But I'll, let me, I'll, I'll Google it, right? Give that a try. Uh, uh, cubic feet. Let's see, cubic feet, two liters. And one cubic feet, one cubic foot is equal to 28.3 liters, right? So what is, what is a volume in, in liters? It's going to be equal to 2,500 times, what did I say it was? 20, 28 point, somebody here has a better memory than I do. <laughs> okay, that's going to be 700,000, right, liters. So what's the concentration of parts per million, right? Well, how are we going to figure that out? Well, what we're going to figure out is, is that there's a relationship here, right? X over 1 million. Right? Put an equal sign. Imagine an equal sign between these two, right? 224 is to 707,000 as X is to a million, right? The equal sign. So how do we, count, how do we resolve that? I'm sorry. I'm gonna, you know, I'll do it on, I'll do it on paper. Probably make more sense to you on paper. Where is this thing? Let me pull this up. Okay. I'll move this down here so I can see it. I won't forget the numbers again. It's hell getting old. Two hundred twenty-four liters in. Out of 707,500 liters of air. This is the total volume of room. This is the volume of acid. But we want it in parts per million. So how much acetone is there in a million liters of air? So we set up this equation, a ratio. We want to know what is this rate? What is, what's the equivalent ratio if there were a million cubic uh, cube, uh, liters of air in the room? Okay, well, I can cross multiply here, right? X times 707,500 is equal to 224 million, right? So, and to solve for X, I divide by 707,500. Okay, anybody do that calculation? 316.6? That is our, that's our parts per million. What's the units on that? What do, you, what do you think the units are in that? We got liters, right? What is this over here? This is liters, this is liters, and this is liters. Right, they all cancel out, right? It's unitless. Volume, you know, like volume in air, you know, parts per million air is unitless. Now, we might have asked you, what's the concentration as milligrams per liter, or milligrams more likely per cubic meter? We'd have to do a whole other conversion than that, right? In fact, there's a, there's a, there are quick conversions we can do that change back and forth. There's a quick formula we can use that's in your tables here to calculate. So that's one, that's one of the things we might, now we know what the concentration is. We know if the, if the permissible exposure limit is 1,000, which it probably is or something like that for acetone, below the permissible exposure limit. Okay, so I just want to cover one more thing, and then you guys can make a run for it. In fact, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do it online because I don't want to keep you guys, especially the first night. I don't I think I'm going to like just keep you keep you captive here, you know, at uh, in, in at close to midnight. Okay, let me just hit play. Yeah. Oh, you see the uh, the battery. I'm almost done. almost done anyway. Okay, let me hit play here. Just go and scoot through this. Okay. Um. 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 Uh. uh now this there's, there's actually there is various versions of this that we work with in the book in the future chapters and stuff like that. The thing I'm going to do online is an exercise that I told you to think about. 
And that is if in the uh, in the uh, equipment room at uh, the stadium in Foxborough, they had filled the footballs to 12.5 PSI, and they took it out to the game, and at halftime, the temperature was 50 degrees, what would the pressure be? Remember, the temperature goes down. What happens to the pressure? It goes down also. Right? Pressure and volume can go down also. So the pressure will drop because of that. Is it enough to account for what happened uh, uh, in, in Foxborough? And we're gonna—I'll I'll do this calculation online. I'll do this calculation online. You can give me your opinion as to whether uh, Brady and uh, Belichick are guilty. Uh, <laughs> 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 